My name's Simon Bowler, and this is episode two of our oak frame gazebo build. Let's rewind a little bit and see what's happened this week. So today is frame installation day. There's a couple of things that have to happen before we can start lifting beams into place. We have to cut our posts to length. And in order to do that, we have to understand the relationship between each staddle stone because they are not level. In isolation, each one is level, but in relation to each other, they follow the fall of the patio. So we're gonna use the laser level to find our highest stone, use that as our datum and cut each other leg to suit the height of our staddle stones, which will give us a level wall plate. It's fairly straightforward, you'll see shortly. Now, frame installation day, I do find it quite stressful for a couple of reasons. It's the culmination of a lot of effort. Several days have been spent preparing all these beams. And although we're confident everything's gonna fit, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. The other reason I find it stressful is these beams are extremely heavy. So there's a lot of hard work to be done. So there's our genie lift. They are our mechanical arms for lifting the beams. The best we get on with it. So we found that this stone is the highest one. So we've set the laser level to read level on that one. Over here, because the patio falls away, it slopes away this way, this stone is much lower. In fact, it's that much lower. So we have to make this post that much longer than that post. Sounds quite convolute, but it's actually straightforward. So we're gonna go around and find how many glazing packers it takes on each stone to bring the laser level up to level, and that then will tell us how much to add on to each post to make sure that the wall plate is level all the way around. So we found the length of that post by taking our walk under height, as we call it, which is the distance between the patio and the underside of the wall plate, that is 2.1 metres. So we took 2.1 metres, deducted the height of the staddle stone, which is 230 millimetres, and cut it to that now known length. They always look ever so short when they're sat on the trestles like this, but when they're stood up, they are much, much higher. The next process, the last process with this post before installation is to drill a hole in the bottom because there is a pin in the top of each staddle stone and that locates the post to the staddle stone. Now I appreciate quite a lot has happened since the last little clip. Whilst we were cutting our post to length and lifting the beams into place, a heavy rain shower presented itself followed by a snow shower, none of which is convenient to filming coupled with the fact that when you're lifting these very heavy beams above your head using the genie lift, you've really got to keep your wits about you because although we do it in a safe fashion, if it goes wrong, it wouldn't end well. Anyway, yesterday was a good day. So now we've got half the dowels in. Notice on this side, all the knee braces are strapped up, all the joints absolutely as tight as we can get them. So we're working on putting the dowels in and that's the process we're going to look at now there was one other process that we put the wall plates through before we lifted them into place, and that's routering a groove in the top. Now you can't see it, it's out of sight, that's on purpose. What we've learned is that a lot of clients like to have an LED strip installed to uplight the ceiling. If you don't put a groove in, you can just see those LEDs. So we like to look after the electrician and put a groove in to suit that LED strip. It's wide enough to suit either just the strip or perfection is to use a diffuser and it looks extremely good even if I say so myself. As well as router and a groove we also installed the collar tie as we call it. That's the beam in the middle. The purpose of that is to attach the left and right sides so that they don't bow out under the compressive force of the roof when that gets put on. We attach that with these very long M12 stainless steel coach screws. There are one or two other coach screws that you can't see. Going through the installation process, the half laps on the corners, we like to put some stainless steel bolts through them just to make sure that they don't move around as we add components to the frame. Okay, moving on to the dowels. So we've set out where the four dowels are going to go in this post. There's two dowels go through each mortise and tenon joint. The tool that we use to drill those holes is this. 
Now, be under no illusions. This is not a toy, although it looks very dinky and very dainty, it isn't. It's a very, very high torque, low revs engineering drill is what it is, but it's quite astonishing in how much power it delivers. In fact, it's quite dangerous as well because it has no clutch. The oak that we're gonna drill is quite chewy and it takes a lot of getting through and that's what this little thing does. To keep the hole straight, we use this. This is a drill guide that I had fabricated many, many years ago. It's made out of stainless steel. And it works like this. We don't let that big drill burst all the way through the post, just the threaded tip. If you let it come all the way through, it ends up leaving a bit of a mess. So we finish it off from the other side with the same size drill bit on a cordless. So those holes go all the way through the post, through the mortise, through the tenon, and out the back of the post. And this oak dowel, with a bit of beeswax on, gets driven all the way through and that's what holds the knee braces in place. We do like to leave the dowels long. They look very decorative. You can see here where the hammers damage the end. That doesn't matter because we trim them off all to a uniform length. So it's just a case of repeat, repeat, repeat until all the dowels are in. There's two dowels per mortise and tenon joint. So that's a lot of dowels, best we get on with it. So that's all the dowels in, a good chapter over. The final thing that we do to the oak frames on these projects is knock the corners off the post and the wall plate with the router and we use this chamfer bit in the cordless router. The detail is called a stop chamfer for one very specific reason because it stops. It's as technical as that. So safety glasses are going on because it's a messy job. Time to router. New day today and typically it's raining. Anyway, we have to carry on. So the roofing material has just turned up. These are the hip rafters and the ridge, seven by two and eight by two respectively. These are the rest of the rafters. They are five by two and on the floor down there is the tongue and groove which we use to cover the rafters up from above. Now we can move on to looking at how we set the roof out. Follow me. So this jig, is what we use to set our common rafters out. The long piece on the floor is a representation of the top of the wall plate of the width of the building. The leg protruding up is a representation of how high the roof is going to be and that cross brace is just to keep it square. So if you imagine this is the top of the wall plate, we've got a line on here that represents the depth of our bird's mouth. So all we do now is plonk a rafter on draw around it and that tells us the plumb cut at the top and the position and angle of the bird's mouth. Now I accept you can do all of this based off nothing other than maths. We prefer to do it like this, it suits us. I am not a mathematician. So let's get a rafter, draw around it, cut it out and see if it fits.
So that is our common rafter with its plum cut on one end ready to go up to the ridge and its bird's mouth ready to hook over the wall plate. This becomes our pattern. We can now cut a series of these exactly the same which will fit along our ridge and one at either end of the hip roof as well. So we've had a productive couple of hours. All the common rafters are on, the ones that we made from the template and three out of the four hip rafters are on as well. You can see we've left all the rafters extremely long. That's on purpose. There is quite a big eaves overhang detail on this and there's an also an extra little detail, a little kick that we're going to look at in the fullness of time. It's not that big, obviously you wouldn't be able to walk under it if we left it that big, but we prefer to cut those off after the fact. So we're going to take a look at the fourth hip rafter now because that's slightly different to the common rafters. So over to the chop saw. So this is our last hip rafter. It is seven inches by two inches, so quite a lot deeper than the five by two common rafters. The angle of the roof is 30 degrees, but the hip rafter angle is different because it has to project further into the roof in order to maintain the angle on all four sides. It sounds quite confusing, but it isn't really. So the angle of the hip rafter is 22 degrees, but it has to be cut in both directions because it has to interface with the rafters that are already there. So that's what we're going to do now, put two compound mitres on it. So I've turned the saw to 22 degrees and tipped it over to 45 degrees. One side cut. The other side cut. So if you come around here, so you can see there's quite a lot of angles going on here. 45 degrees that way, 22 degrees that way times two. But that will interface very nicely with the rafters that are already there, which we'll take a look at in a minute. The other thing we have to do to this is put the bird's mouth on. Again, that is slightly different to the ones that we cut on the common rafters. So the bird's mouth on the hip rafter, as I said before, is slightly different to the bird's mouth on the common rafters. We aim to take out in the region of a third of the material in the bird's mouth on the common rafters. Now this is deeper because what we're looking for is the same amount of material to be left. So we have to take out more to accommodate that. That's so that the top of this hip rafter follows the same plane as the rest of the rafters on the structure already. That's why it's deeper. And that's what we're gonna cut out now. So you can see how the bird's mouth on the hip rafter hooks over the wall plate, just like all the rest of the rafters. And you can see how the top of the hip lines up with the top of everything else. And then on the inside, you can see how the seven by two hip rafter interfaces with the eight by two ridge, which in turn interfaces with all the rest of the rafters. So they're all different dimensions so that the length of the cuts all line up just makes it a bit prettier and a bit neater. So the last chapter of the hand cut roof is to put the jack rafters on, as some people call them. Essentially, they're the ones that make up the gap between the last common rafter and the hip rafter, and they're slightly different again. So we'll go over to the chop saw and have a look at those. So the first thing that we do to make these jack rafters is put a compound mitre on. So that's a cut that has two angles on it. We've turned the saw to 30 degrees in that direction, to suit the angle of the roof and we've tipped the saw to 45 degrees because that's the angle of the cut at the end in order that it marries up to the hip rafter. So we'll cut that now and then we'll explain how we set the bird's mouth out because it's a bit different to the common rafters. So if you take a look there, you can see 45 degrees in that direction and 30 degrees in that direction. So the bird's mouth then, again, before you can do this all based off maths with a roofing square, this is how we prefer to do it. This piece of timber here has been cut at the depth of our bird's mouth. So we're gonna put a line, the depth of our bird's mouth from the top of the rafter down. You'll see why in a minute. So normally this would be a two man process, but for the purpose of this video, we've tacked this rafter in place. 
30 degree matches the roof angle, 45 degree matches the hip rafter. And that line that we put on, the depth of the bird's mouth, you can see there it's stood up by that much. Next job is to mark the bird's mouth down at the wall plate and we're going to use that same piece of timber to do that. So this is the simplest way that we've found to mark the angles and the positions of these. That's the depth of the bird's mouth. It sits straight on top of the wall plate, draw a line across, and then the same piece of timber up the back of the wall plate marks the back of the bird's mouth. It's that simple. Back up on the roof structure now, so this one is positioned 400 millimetres off the first common rafter and you can see that the compound mitre, the top of that now sits flush with the top of the hip and you can see that the bird's mouth sits nice and tight around the wall plate. That process works for us, it ensures that everything lines up first time, every time. Now it's just a case of repeat, repeat, repeat until we've got all of these jack rafters on and we can look at cutting them off the plum cuts. Rafters are done. I do very much enjoy putting hand cut roofs on, which leads me on to the next bit, which is the plum cuts. They cut at the end of each rafter, which not surprisingly is plum. So we've been round, we've measured 300 millimetres off the wall plate. That is going to be our eaves overhang detail. That's substantially more than we normally put on, but that's what's been designed on this one. We have done it before and it does look very good with that additional extra overhang. String line is up, We've been round with our angle finder and marked all the plum cuts. Now it's just a case of cut them off in a nice, neat, straight line. So that is the end of this episode. In the next episode we're going to be looking at the final roof finish which is Western Red Cedar. Thank you very much for watching folks. Please, if you don't mind, subscribe to the channel and I will see you in the next episode. Bye for now.